Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I'm going to be going through my 100 essential progressive rock albums. I've already done 50, I've already done 50 and God, it's taken it out of me and I thought nobody wants to sit through all this so I've decided to break it into two videos. I've done that on the cuff so I've, I've stopped. I haven't actually had a break, I thought let's just keep going. So I'm now going to go through from 49 to number 1. We're, we're now on the, on, the, on the home straight up to number 1. Okay, so shall we start at 49? I'm going to be going quick on this, so it's not going to be one of my normal videos. For those of you who don't like to listen to me go on and on about albums, they just want to know the list and this is the video for you. Right, so at number 49, I have Houses of the Holy by Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin, they're a progressive rock band, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And they are their most progressive rock on Houses of the Holy with the um, integration of all that keyboard and arrangement skill from John Paul Jones. This is where John Paul Jones steps forward and really starts to really expand the palette of what is basically a, a power rock trio with all his incredible work and then we've got all the acoustic mandolin stuff from Jimmy Page um, and absolutely they push the they push the um, envelope on styles as well they, they just push it to the max it's full of the sort of most progressive rock sort of themes with the sort of Tolkien elements that run through the lyrics um, it's their most proggy album it's a masterpiece I've got it number 49 at number 48, I have uh, Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds that came out in 1978 in that year where prog was supposed to be dead and yet we had bands like Sky, we had Variations by Andrew Lloyd Webber and we had this in the UK. 1978 was where prog was at its peak and nobody wants to say it, <laughs> it after punk. And, and, and the War of the Worlds has gone on to become here in the UK an absolute phenomenon with its own stage show, it's got its own theme park, it's got its own rides, it's got its own everything. You know, Jeff Wayne has milked this to the nth degree. Um, it's an incredible album. I think that part of the success is Jeff Wayne's marriage of high conceptual progressive rock with disco. And of course, disco is the real anathema. It's the real antichrist of prog. And yet here we have it mixed together and working well. So um, that's what I've got at number 48. At number 47, I have the debut album by Emerson, Lake and Palmer, which some people think is their greatest album. It's The bombast is less there. Um, they, they haven't quite become the sort of outlandish, you know, bell pulling, you know, Persian rug stomping bands and um, they are finding their feet and basically laying the groundwork for Progressive Rock. It's a very beautiful album. It's quite a subtle album for ELP. That's what I've got at number 47. At number 46, I have Starless and the Bible Black, which is the middle album of the three, um, of the sort of what I call the second incarnation. We've got the proggy King Crimson at the start where they have all the personnel changes. And then he comes back out with this Bill Bruford, um, Jamie Muir, um, John Wetton, David Cross, King Crimson, it's a lot heavier, it's a lot darker. Um, Stars of the Bible Black is actually called from a lot of live recordings and improvisations. And, um, and so the concision isn't quite the same as the other two. Um, it's a masterpiece. And for me, on, on a certain day, it will be my favourite King Crimson album. So the fact I put it in here is just the fact that it's not just not quite as concise as Lark's Tongues and, and Red but still a masterpiece. It's at number 46 on my list. At number 45, I have Power and the Glory by Gentle Giant. Again, another masterpiece. Where are you going to put them? I've tried to sort of rank them here. It's a ridiculous thing. Power and the Glory is one of their greatest albums, as is most of their albums. It's very hard. That's the problem with Gentle Giant. I've done my best. They're on the list, though. At number 44, I have 2112 by Rush. Right, this is the album that broke Rush. A white did, nobody understands. They'd made Fly By Night, which was on the list earlier. They'd made Caress of Steel, which was on the list earlier. And here they are putting this weird sort of proggy metal, sword and sorcery weirdness. And nobody wants it. So what did they do? They decided to come full out and do it more and do it bigger and do it better. And I think it's the fact that they did it better. I think it took them time to really understand what the Rush, Rush sound was. And that magical mixture of one side long epic and then, you know, four or five really concise, um, more accessible songs, that mixture is a magical mixture. And this album then goes ballistic and enabled Rush to then go on for another 40 odd years and be one of the biggest bands in the world. And it's really strange that they did it 
on a album which has got a sidelong track which um, you know evokes a dystopian future influenced by the right wing philosopher Ayn Rand very weird right so um, number 43 I've got Studio Tan by Frank Zappa I didn't want to put too much Zappa on this list because he could fill it up because he's a genius there has to be a sum on there and Studio Tan contains a sidelong epic Gregory Peckery which is one of the greatest prog epics of all time it's insane and no normal progressive rock band could ever pull anything off that is as majestic and strange and weird and comical and musical and and um with the the the, the rich palette of of gregory peckery and then on side two you've got a, an insane compositions this is this is one of the great compositional albums by frank zappa and it doesn't get mentioned. I think I need to elevate it up because if you're a progressive rock band, it's, it's, a, it's a great album to go for. At number 42, I have The Dreaming by Kate Bush. I've always said that Kate Bush is the queen of progressive rock, that she's a progressive rock artist. Again, she emerges in 1978 in that year with Wuthering Heights. She emerges in that year where Prog's supposed to be dead and yet we've got variations we've got sky we've now got all the worlds and now we've got wuthering heights all sounding very very progressive um she sort of reached her progressive peak on never forever that's the album before this and then on the dreaming she then gets the prog thing i mean just pushes it forward and she goes into the future and on this album which wasn't a success at the time she is pushing the envelope it is truly progressive and it's progressive both of them and it's very and and it's and it was popular in terms of prog, you know, it sold well. In terms of Kate Bush, it didn't sell that well. But anyway, that's what I got. Number 42 is The Dreaming. At number 41, I have Relayer by Yes, which is a masterpiece. Gates of Delirium, I think when I did my greatest prog, rec prog rock epics of all time, it came out as number one. Right, and I've still got this, you know, this is, this is the genius of prog. How many styles of music can we have all this incredible stuff here um i feel like i've put this pretty low on the list and the reason is is because i didn't want the top clogged up by um yes but it's a masterpiece it's a masterpiece um people love side two i was never so keen on side two it was a that was a bit rambly for me in in the same way as tales on topic Gra graphic oceans could be a little bit rambly as well Side one, incredible. Just a little bit of, I don't know. Uh, and that's what's put it down, right? I um, wanted to put a couple of country bands on. Um, I put Land of Grey and Pink at number 40 by Caravan. It's one of the masterpieces of the Canterbury scene. Um, Caravan are one of the great bands. They're, they're probably the most sort of evocative of the Canterbury sound, which is this very virtuoso, um, intensely composed and yet quirky ethereal and light sound and uh, that is the sound of this album it's an incredible album at number 39 we have in a glass house by a gentle giant another masterpiece uh, in a glass house has this lovely structure to it which is they never went for epics but there's some long tracks then a little track and then a long track and then you put it on the side two and you get a long track a little track and a long track and this album is just a is is just sat more proggy for having those songs which are a little bit developed but like i say gentle giants it's all genius isn't it uh, number 38 and uh, sitting behind me we have tales from topographic oceans um this album was seen as the sort of um the the, the low point of progressive rock where it got just too indulgent that was the narrative i grew up with i think as time has gone on and people have gone back and listened to it and realized it's 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 a lot more concise and controlled it is a little bit rambly it's it's but it, if you're going to make an album with four epics based upon some weird esoteric you know um uh sort of um what what's it based upon it's 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 the um yogi yogic sort of way of living you know it's it's this is a this is a hard sell and i think considering that it they pretty they do it pretty well if you think about what they're trying to do right it's going to be rambly if you've got you know just a double album with just four 20 minute tracks on that's going to be rambly what else it's going to be you know it's a hard thing to take on 
bored, you know, and I think that's what really killed it. Um, but I think as time has gone and it's, it's been reevaluated, and there's so many incredible moments, and for me, uh, there's certain moments on this which is the high point of yes, when they are at their most yes. So that's what we've got at number 38 is Tales from Topographic Oceans. At number 37, we have by From Magma Mechanic Destructive Commando. The famous album, the one that everyone says is the best, you know. Um, I'm no expert on Magma. I've listened to a lot of them. There is a live Magma album, which I think is my favourite, where they, they've got um, Didier Lockwood on violin. I don't know the name of it. Um, and they really go into sort of almost like a Mavish Noxia um, um, territory. I would be indulgent to put that album down. I think this is seen as being their great masterpiece. So that's what I've got at number 37. At number 36, I have another European prog band from PFM. Per un Amico, which is an absolute masterpiece. This is the most detailed, it takes you on a journey, it's full of so much instrumentation and complexity, and it's wonderful in that it hasn't, although it's borrowing from that English progressive sound, it, it, the, Italian, which, the Italian approach, which you hear with bands like Banco and a whole, whole bunch of other uh, bands, and I've done a whole video on European prog. For me, if we really want to get into European prog, Per Amico is just, the, it's like one of the masterpieces. It's an incredible album. I only heard it quite recently. Uh, I can remember having a bath and putting it on and just going, this is incredible. I wish I'd heard it when I was a lot younger because I think it would have opened up the world of European prog, you know, instead of listening to um, whatever it was, Faust or something, which I didn't quite get anyway. Uh, at number 35, I've got Disciplined by King Crimson, the first of the sort of 80s um, resurgence of King Crimson, where they pull in elements of New Wave, of punk, of, of um, Gamelon, of um, avant-garde, free jazz, all these things come together, and Robert Fripp, yet again, redefines what prog is. I think he, this is the third time he's done it, perhaps the fourth. Right, so um, that's what I've got at number 35 is discipline. At number 34, I have A Ship Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch by Frag Zappa. This is the one that's got Valley Girl, which is definitely not a prog, prog track, but Side 2, which has A Ship Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch, and then Envelopes, and then Into Teenage Prostitute. It's again one of Zappa's great sidelong epics, and it's more prog than anybody's ever been. You know, at one point it goes into sort of almost like um, a, a, um, a, a Webern-esque 12-tone and yet rock section, which is envelopes, which then runs into this sort of fake opera song about a teenage person. It's just bonkers. And um, uh, Ship to Late Saving Driving, which contains two of Zappa's greatest guitar solos. It's all pulled together, it's partly live, it's partly studio, it's all pulled together, it has that incredible con compositional coherence that only Zappa can really do, uh, and it's a masterpiece, and so it's on at number 34. At number 33, I have Metal for Sieg by Alan Holdsworth, which is an out and out prog album, right? Holdsworth albums aren't that proggy, Right, this is a prog album. Um, it's got like almost like progressive metal elements in here. We've got a, a big long epic, which is about 15 minutes, which goes through different chapters. We've got we've got songs on here, and those songs have sort of progressive rock themes. Um, it's a full-on progressive rock album. It's also Alan Holdsworth, and Alan Holdsworth is one of the great progressive rock guitarists. You know, as in Gong and. Um, you know, UK is going to be on this list here. I really feel, and I'm making the argument here, that um, Metal Fatigue is his great progressive rock album. And if you're a progressive rock fan, check it out. Um, at number 32, I have A Little Man and a House by Cardiacs. I think the title of that album is much longer, but uh, I couldn't be asked. So that's where we got um, Cardiacs again. I'm representing the fringes of Prog's Cardiacs, one of the great progressive rock bands, but it's a, it's a weird mix of avant-garde, modern classical music, punk, new wave, and prog. Um, there's all different eras of Cardiacs. It's really hard to get your head around. This was their first album that, where they had a major deal, but it really sums up, they've been around for 10 years before then, it sums up that stuff. 
I'm no expert on Cardiacs. Um, I put three albums on the list. Um, all of those could be easily argued to be their greatest albums. But um, on the whole, if you look at the fans and you look at the, and I've really been researching for this list, this is the one that seems to come up the most as being the sort of fan favourite. Um, so that's what I got at number 32. At number 31, I've got Angel's Egg by Gong, the middle one of the Flying Teapot trilogy. Steve Hillage is now in the band. It's it's quirky, it's weird, and and that it's got, unlike a lot of the other Gong albums, a lot of quite short tracks and it moves quite quickly. It's probably the most accessible of the Flying Teapot trilogy. Um, I put it here lower than the other two, really. We, we, we just got one masterpiece after another, so that's what I got at number 31's Angel's Egg. Number 30, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway by um, Genesis. It's their prog peak. Um, they're moving towards a double album in much the same way as Yes, they're going, moving towards uh, Tales of Topographic Oceans. This is the anomaly because Genesis, a quintessential English aesthetic band with that sort of quirky Englishness all through it. Here, they drop that and they, they, they take on a sort of an American folklore, um, mystical, weird, Dante's Inferno, you know, Paradise Lost thing on here. It's very strange, very weird. Some people feel that it sags. When I was a kid and I got tales from Topographic Oceans, I did feel that it sagged. I never felt this album sagged. I was too involved in the story and I was still involved trying to work out what the hell was going on. <clears throat> For many years, this was my favorite album by um, Genesis. Um, and the only reason it's not now is because I bought into that English quirkiness more as, as, as I've got older. So uh, that's what we have. Um, where the hell are we gone this list? Um, at what number was that? At number 30, Lamb Lies Down, Genesis. Whoa. This is something else doing this, I tell you. Right, so it's really, it's the stamina and the jumping between so many different bands. It's really hard work, but I'm, I'm, I wanted to do this. I've, 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 I've also done the 100 greatest jazz rock albums of all time, and I'm gonna do that. But I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to work a strategy out, because this is hard work, I tell you. It's hard work. Right, so number 29, I've got Songs of the Wood by Jethro Tull. It's, that's my second favourite Jethro Tull album. A little bit later, a little bit English um, aesthetic, that medieval madness that you get from Jethro Tull, but it's also a lot more concise, a little bit more rocking as well, and insanely complex. The title track, Songs for the Wood, is like one of the most co complex moments that ri rivals Gentle Giant for sort of density. It's incredible. So that's why I've got number 29. At number 27, I've got Moving Ways from Focus. Moving Ways, of course, is the one that contains um, Hocus Pocus. I think it's possibly Focus's greatest album. You know, what can you say? Masterpiece. Um, at number 26, I've got One of a Kind by Bill Bruford. This is the second solo album he made after Feels Good to Me. It's the masterpiece of those albums. It features on holes on guitar. It's just incredible. It, verging towards jazz fusion but there's there's enough on there to root it back in progressive rock which i really think comes from bill bruford's um um bill bruford does he's a funky drummer and a groovy drummer but his his grooves and funk are very it's very straight laced my friend uh and the, the incredible drummer mark mondesier said that his drumming is like a savile roast a savile roast suit which apparently um, Bill Bruford liked that description of it, and I like that description, and that's what this music is. It's prog. It's 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 no, it's fusion, but it's like a Savile Row, Row suit of fusion. Right at number twenty-five, I've got Animals by um, Pink Floyd. Right, um, so after Dark Side of the Moon, they do Wish You Were Here, and then they do Animals, and it's their last full-on prog album. It's um, a, a concept album based around. Um, uh, Animal Farm, where Roger Water tries to invert that idea and rather than uh, using it to criticise sort of the, the left, hard left Stalinism, it criticises sort of uh, the 
a, a right wing that he perceives in there. The imagery of this album he has mined up until this day. It's a very important album in terms of Roger Waters staking his worldview, I think, that we then see carried on into the war. Um, for, for proggers, it's like they're the last hurrah of, of Pink Floyd as a prog band. At uh, number 24, we have my favourite album by Jethro Tull, which is Stand Up, which I think is the third album, isn't it? So they've still got a little bit of their foot in that sort of blues rock sound. It's I just love Stand Up. It's got a certain sound, and and, it, and it, it's, it's before they've gone... Je Je Jethro Tull go a little bit too airy fairy and flowery for me there's too much detail there and and the rock aspect gets forgotten and on stand up it's still there it rocks it's the, it's the jethro tall sound it's got that sort of rasan roland kirk sort of jazzy vibe to it. it's got the bluesy sound to the you know barrymore barlow's an absolute virtuoso drummer it's one of the greatest um, prog drummers of all time but clive bunk has got a more earthy sound to him and i do really like that so that's what I got. Number twenty-four is "Stand Up" by Jethro Tull. At number twenty-three, I have the Yes album by Yes, the album that introduced me to prog, the album that I swapped for. Um, I had a Silver Machine disc, Picture Disc, uh, Hawkwind, and I swapped that for this album that my friend said was unlistenable, and it was the Yes album, and it wasn't unlistenable. It opened the door to me to all this music and all this music behind me. The Yes album, not quite. The Yes We Know, because we haven't got Rick Wakeman in the band, so we haven't quite nailed that sound. And it's, 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 the Yes album's got its own sound to me. It's got its own sound. It is their first masterpiece. It's an incredible album. At number 22, I've got Nursery Crime by Genesis, um, which I think is their third album. We've got, we've got the first album, which isn't really a prog album. They've got Trespass, and they start to find their sound. And on Nursery Crime, we get, Phil Collins and Steve Hackett joining the mix. And it's the sound of those two musicians coming in and go, oh, we solved it. And that's what Nursery Crime is. It's, it's like my, it has become my favourite um, uh, Genesis album. And the Genesis sound that I love, it's the thing that affects me in the same way that when I hear um, a TV themes from children program from my youth, that affects me in a certain way. Nursery Crime has the same effect. And a lot of the Genesis albums do that, but not as concentrated as you get on Nursery Crime, which is, so it's my favorite album, I'll put it at number 22. And number 21, I've got UK, the album UK by the band, the supergroup UK, which was Eddie Jobs and John Witt and Al Noldsworth and Bill Bruford, an incredible album, virtuoso, beautiful, it's an, in, it's an incredible album. Apparently Al Noldsworth did not enjoy his time in this band because he, he wanted to improvise and it's very hemmed in. But it does contain some of Holdsworth's greatest moments. And for many people, this is one of the greatest progressive rock albums ever made. And I agree. At number 20, I have my favourite of the country bands, uh, Hatfield of the North with the Rotters Club. It's complex. It's weird. It's quirky. It's funny. There's a sense of humour to it. It's, it's light and yet it's heavy. Um, it's my favourite of the Canterbury uh, albums i'm not an expert on the canterbury scene whatsoever but that was the album that i grew up with um by hatfield in the north i absolutely love it at number 19 i've got radio gnome the first album the flying teapot trilogy by gong this is where gong finally find their feet we have on camera bear electric the the flashes of the brilliance of gong and then on on flying teapot we just it suddenly, suddenly comes together and there's some incredible improvisations, there's incredible sort of um, uh, journeys into the psychedelic on this album. Um, Steve Hillage is on it, but we don't really hear him. We haven't got Pierre Mall on, so it's, it's not quite got the sound, but it, it's got its own sound. So many of these prog bands, when they haven't quite coalesced, they're more interesting for it. And that's what I've always found. I've always loved right, that album, Radio Gnome. Invisible, I think it's called. And number 18, we have in another album that really kicks off this style. We've got In the Court of the Kings and King by King Crimson. An incredible album. 21st Century Schizoid Man, basically 
they lay the groundworks for prog and do everything that prog's going to do really on that one track it's very few styles of music where a band comes out and lays the groundwork so fully as king crimson do on that this is um partly i think the fact that at this point king crimson wasn't robert fripp it was king crimson it's it's a product of a whole bunch of geniuses that just could not work together but there's a little bit of overindulgence on this album, a little bit of just sort of meandering around and not kicking like they should. And so I, I've always really enjoyed this album, but I've never felt it's as great as people make it out to be. Um, many people would feel that this needs to be in the top five, but not for me. Um, 21st Century Schizoid Band would definitely be very high on the list of the greatest prog tracks ever made. That's why I've got number 18. And number 17, another album which I have difficulty with um, but as some people think it's an absolute masterpiece it is third by Soft Machine. Um, Soft Machine by the 70s have turned into a jazz rock fusion band and for me they're beyond the remit of this list. Um, they start off in a sort of poppy psychedelic band and then we see this slow move over to sort of improvisation and long form structures. Third is where it's at its peak um, it is like an English version of Frank Zappa and the Mothers at the same time. And although I really do enjoy this album, and there's incredible moments on there, being such a Zappa fan and, and growing up listening to Bert Weenie Sandwich and Weasel Whip My Fresh Flesh, which came out at the same time, this seems very influenced by that and not quite as successful in that they, do, they don't have the virtuosity that the Zappas, the Mothers have. Um, and that's always coloured this album for me. But I think uh, f for Prog at that time, what they were doing with, with this album was so groundbreaking and they were pushing the envelope so much that it has an importance, which I probably cannot appreciate because I wasn't there at the time. Um, it is probably their greatest album. Soft Machine needs to be on the list and that's what we've got. And uh, at number 17, he's third by Soft Machine. At number 16, I've got Lark's Tongues in Aspect by King Crimson, which is the first of the, the revamped King Crimson, the Bill Bruford King Crimson, an absolute masterpiece of an album. Um, I've always felt that Red is the greatest, and obviously Red's going to come up in a minute. But as time's going on, this album is elevating more and more, and it's the presence of Jamie Muir, which gives it a sound all of its own. Again, it's that thing again of, of the sound not quite coalescing and being more interesting for it. Um, it there's a wider palette of sounds on this album and there's a little bit of a nod of them to the more progressive sort of modern classical sound of the king crimson that went before which i i like um at number 15 we have um fragile by yes this is the first really proper Yes album. It contains Roundabout, it contains In the Heart of the Sunrise, it contains um, many of their greatest tunes, um, um, Long Distance Run Around, tunes which are quintessentially Yes. It also contains all these little solo pieces by the band, which I think full on Yes fans, they don't like those bits so much. They just want them to get on. You know, they're not interested in Bill Brook with some weird linear track that lasts, this lasts for two minutes and so this doesn't have the sort of compositional coherence of a close to the edge or a relayer but I love it for that it's a, again it's this same thing that's coming out on this list is that the prog bands when they find their sound they create a masterpiece and just before then the experiment of getting there can be really quirky I love all the quirky experiments on this album I just love it and there's a side of me I think that this is my favourite Yes album, I think, you know, um, and, you know, in, in The Heart of the Sunrise and, and Roundabout, there's moments in there which are the most Yes moments on record, in a way. I don't know how you compare these albums, but I've got that to number 15. At number 14, I have Trick of the Tale uh, by Genesis. It's the first album they made after um, Peter Gabriel left. It's a full-on prog album. There's a strong argument, and I've said it elsewhere, that this is Genesis's greatest album in terms of prog. 
It's the best recorded, it's the best produced, the compositions are incredible, the playing's incredible, it doesn't sag, it doesn't have any weirdness, and all the other albums have a little bit of weirdness here and there that makes you doubt it. It's, it's, it's rock solid all the way through. It's just missing Peter Gabriel, that's all it is. And uh, of course, Phil Collins steps forward and does an incredible job. You know, um, I think Gabriel provides a focus, he provides a prog focus, in, and his voice has... Um, a darkness and rich to its richness to it, which Phil Collins, who's an incredible singer, I one of my favourite singers, but he doesn't quite have that. Um, but many Genesis fans feel that this is their greatest album, and so I put it pretty high on the list. Um, uh, here we've got it at um, where is it? Number fourteen. And number thirteen, I've got Brain Salad Surgery by ELP. Again, this is. 1973, this is where the prog bands are at their peak. They do everything they possibly can on this album. I always dislike the fact that you got Benny the Bouncer on it, but as time's gone on, I, I that little that's the little dot in the yin and the yang, isn't it? That is you need it there. There's nothing wrong with it. It it it, it it's it's quirky Englishness and it and it just deflates some of the pomposity of this album. For me, as I've got older, I understand why that's there. And as much as I would like to have this incredibly dark sort of um, H.R. Geiger-esque, you know, cover and all this, you know, stuff that's going on in there. Um, I, I, I think their version of Jerusalem is, Jerusalem is a, them at their best. I don't like that so much. Um, apart from that, the rest of it's just incredible. And Carnival 9 is just like mind-blowing, isn't it? Absolutely mind-blowing. And that's why we've got it up here it's so high at number 13. At number 12, I've got One Size Fits All by Frank Zappa, which does what it says on the tin. This is the album that if you want to introduce yourself to Zappa, is the one you go for first. But it's full on, and it Roads is one of the great progressive rock moments in prog history. Zappa's all over this album. It's, it's the best version, the best band by Zappa, which is the George Duke band with Chester Thompson on drums and Ralph Humphrey, although Ralph Humphrey's departed by this point. Um, it's an incredible album. Um, for me, it is his prog peak, and so that's why I put it here. Zappa could easily have filled up all the top ten that we're about to go into, and I didn't want to do that, so he's demoted down to number 12. And number 11, we have Octopus by Gentle Giant, which um, I think... It's become, in my mind, their greatest album. That's why it's the highest on the list here. Uh, and why is Octopus the best? It's, well, they're all masterpieces, but only one of them's got a Roger Dean cover. And that's the only reason why this gets up higher on the list. It's an absolutely perfectly brilliant album. Uh, and I've rated it below what I've got at number 10, which is Porn Hearts. Now, the reason I put Porn Hearts so high is this is me bowing to so many of my friends and prog fans that just love this album and for many people it has to go in the top 10 and I stuck it at number 10 so we're into the top 10 now uh, at, at, um, at number 9 I've got You by Gong what can I say it's just a masterpiece it's like a psychedelic future it, 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 it future looking you know um, exploration into this parallel world that we've been moving towards and the quirkiness that we heard on on flying teapot you know um radio gnome invisible and then the quirkiness that we see on angel egg that's diminished we've arrived at a point which is actually quite serious there's still that gong humor in there but this it's it's in a dark space this album really um foresees what's going to happen in rave culture it's going to sit foresees what's going to happen in sort of alternative culture it's an absolute masterpiece. It's one of my favourite albums of all time. And just through objectivity, I put it a lot lower on the list because I know that certain albums have to be above it. But for me, it's an absolute masterpiece. Um, that's what I've got. Number nine. Number eight, I've got Thick as a Brick by Jethro Tull. This is where they decide, once they've been sort of um, accused of being a prog band, they go, well, we say we're a prog band, like a conceptual band. When, 
we, you know, all right then, we'll show you. And they show us and they make what is one of the greatest progressive rock albums of all time, which is basically just one track and it just runs on and there's that the English humour, there's the English folkiness in there. It's an incredible album. Um, so that's what I've got number eight is Thick as a Brick by Jethro Tull. At number seven, I have Trilogy by ELP. Trilogy, if you go back to my older videos, you get to a point where I was just ignoring ELP. I, I, I turned my back on them. And then I let them in. I had a crisis. So there's a whole video where I ask myself, why am I ignoring ELP? And I decide, now I've got to bring them forth and Brain Salad Surgery is the album. That's their high point. But when I was a kid, my favourite album was Trilogy. And I thought, yeah, but that's just you being a kid. And so I went back and listened to it again. And it is out, without a doubt, it's their greatest album. It's one of the greatest progressive rock albums of all time. It's, it's, they, they, they do everything that ELP do. They don't put a foot wrong. They don't fall into all the traps. They, they, they have that sort of funny comedic side, but it's, it's reined in on this. It's beautifully recorded. It's got a vibe and a sound. I just love Trilogy. It, it, it's, I've, and so I put it at number seven on the list. This is, this is the new thing on this, this list is I've now upgraded Trilogy as being the greatest ELP album and in, in my 10 as the greatest prog albums of all time. And number six, I've got Going For The One by Yes. Right, um, side two of Going For The One, which has Wondrous Stories and then Awaken, I believe is the greatest side on a progressive rock album. Wondrous Stories is, is the best example of drawn in accessible commercial progressive rock it's full-on progressive rock but you can play it on the radio and awaken is the greatest prog epic of all time even on my list in the old days i said it was going to delirium and then i decided no it's awaken side two of going for the one is the greatest side in prog side one is that far off being the greatest side in prog. It's just not quite there. It's, it's really, really good. But that's what drops this album down, is it's, 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 it's only excellent. It's not sublime, whether it's side two is sublime. Um, but I think they're at their peak on side two of going for the one. And number five, I've got Moving Pictures by A Rush. Coming up to 40 minutes. This is a bloody long set of videos, isn't it? Right, anyway, uh, number four, I've got Red by King Crimson. One of the greatest progressive rock albums. It's the, it's the last hurrah of prog. This is Robert Fripp turning around and go, hang on, there's something wrong in the prog camp. That's what I feel with this album. 1974, he's pointing out what's not quite right. And he's saying, it really, this is the plate. We need to go darker. We need to go heavy. We've got to cast off all this frilly walking around the forest and, you know, with the fairy stuff. It's, it's got to get heavier. It's got to get more visceral. You know, he, he's, he's anticipating punk before punk has happened, I feel, on Red. Um, um, and, and in the track Starless we have again one of the great prog epics of all time. So that's why I've got number four is Red by King Crimson. And number three, I've got Foxtrot by Genesis. My favorite album is King Crimson. Is, uh, <laughs> come on, you can make it. My favorite album by Genesis is not King Crimson. My favorite album by Genesis is Nursery Crime. I think objectively their greatest album is Foxtrot. Supper's Ready is their prog peak. It's one of the great peaks in prog. Side one of um, Foxtrot contains masterpieces. They're just not quite as masterpiece-y as, um, as Supper's Ready, which really is, is, is possibly the second greatest prog track ever. Awaken by Yes is probably the greatest prog track ever. The second greatest prog track ever is possibly um supper's ready oh this is hard that's what i got number three and number two i've got dark side of the moon again the, you know pink floyd in my estimation just going up and up we can't argue with dark side of the moon it's just an absolute masterpiece there's not a foot put wrong on the album 
it's it's it, the conceptual um, emotional drive is sustained from beginning to end it's groundbreaking it 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 it's it, it, it it, it represents a high point in progressive rock where progressive rock album bands are able to make albums that are um, at once incredibly deep and moving and yet will sell millions and millions. It's one of the biggest selling albums of all time. It's an absolute achievement. There's an argument that he, this should be at number one as the greatest of achievement of prog. I know that the proggers will turn around and scream at me, but yeah, Pink Floyd are not prog, which is not the case. They are prog. It's just not Yes or Genesis. It's a different prog. If you want to say that they're not prog because Yes and Genesis are prog, you're an idiot because... <laughs> it's like if you were to reframe the world and go, no, that's prog. This band came out in 1960, bloody six or whatever it was, 67, with Pipes at the Gates of Dawn. And on that album, they set this style in motion. They own it. And all the way through it, they have re... Um, they have re... Um, negotiated what prog is and in 1973 they did it again and just because it's not full of long complex tunes with full of virtuosity that you think it's not prog that's only because that's what you've decided prog is and I don't think that's what prog is I don't think that's what prog is prog is something much more you know because if, if it was just about virtuosity then all those jazz rock bands would be prog bands and they're not they're jazz rock bands prog's something else so there's a strong argument it should be at number one but of course at number one I have Close to the Edge by Yes. Um, Close to the Edge does not contain Yes's ultimate high points, right? But what it does do, it's unrelenting in its brilliance. There is at no point where you would turn around and go, I'm not too sure about this bit. It's a perfect album. It's an absolutely perfect album. It's groundbreaking. It's virtuoso, it's um, epic, and it's gutsy, right? It, it takes you on a journey. You have the feeling that they are exploring new ground. You get, you get the feeling that they're completely competent and they know what they're doing. It's sold millions. It's, it's accessible, which is surprising when it's so weird. It is the greatest progressive rock album ever made. Yes, for me, are... The, def the, the, the definition of prog. I understand that. Yes and Genesis for many people are the definition of prog. And uh, so when you've got Yes at their peak, that, that makes them... And I, tr I hope by having Dark Side of the Moon at number two, I've been able to sort of address that. But for me, Yes are the greatest prog band of all time. This is the greatest progressive rock album of all time. And that was my hundred essential... Progressive Rock Albums ranked over two videos, right? This is nearly an hour and a half worth of me talking to camera. I'm tired, I'm cold, I'm hungry. I don't know what day it is. It's going dark, I don't know what the time is. I seem to have been in here for hours. My brain is mushed. That was one of the hardest things I've ever done on my channel, right? Um, all I can say is, coming to the end of this attempt to do this, as I said, this is draft one. I'm going to come back to this over and over again, once a year. I don't want to just come back to the 10 greatest. I want to create the essential 100 albums. I don't think I've done it here. And I, I love the engagement with you guys. I love the engagement with my patrons. And... We will now have a conversation in the comments and I will take it all on board and uh, next year I will come back with a revised list and together we will move through this weird um, conversation we're having through YouTube to coming up with the 100 definitive progressive rock albums of all time. I don't think I've done it here and the proof is that Permanent Waves isn't on the bloody list. Can't believe it. What an idiot. Can't believe it. And the only way, if it's going to go in at 15, the only way to do that is to pull off Caress of Steel, which seems right. Pull off Caress of Steel at 100 and then move everything down and then squeeze it in. I've been doing stuff like that on this list for the past month or so. It's, oh my God, this has been this has been a labour of, I don't know what, not love, I'll tell you that now. <sighs> I'm at the end of the video. If you like this video, I, don't, I tell you something. 
I've spent an hour and a half in here going through this list. I, I, I knew I was going to have to deal with it at some point. I don't feel like I've done a good job here. Sometimes I get to an end of the video and I thought, God, you nailed it then, Andy. You nailed it then. That was good. You had some funny jokes and you got to a peak and all that type of stuff and you were articulate and you didn't stumble over your words, didn't make any mistakes. This is not being that good, has it? Really? It wasn't that good, was it? I've been, I haven't been at my best here, have I? Oh. It's only apt at the end of a 90 minutes of me going through... Um, the hundred greatest progressive rock albums that I am left with a feeling of existential angst. That's the only place you should be when you've done something like this. But life goes on. Somebody else who, <laughs> who had a higher quality level than me would probably go, that didn't work, and they'd learn by it, and they'd scrap all this now, and they go, right, let's go and do this again. That was just a dry run. Let's do it properly this time, and, and, and let's Redo the list, put permanent waves on, and let's do it properly. I don't work like that, though, you see. I can't work like that. I, 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 I want to capture some something that's honest on here. Um, oh, you're getting all pretentious now. But that's the other thing. Existential angst and pretentiousness, that's the only way to end an epic like this, isn't it? There's a side, there's a part of me. You know, I've done this in two parts. There's a part of me who wants to stick it all together and produce something that is, like, nearly two hours long. I don't know whether I'll do that or not. It's, it's not it's not conducive to the audience. And also, it's like, how many people are going to be left, left there after two hours? Hardly anybody. Nah, no, I'll, I'll keep it in two halves. I'm showing you my workings now, aren't I? I'm showing you my workings, aren't I? Anyway, if you like this video, I don't think you should put a like on this video. I don't think I did a good job. Don't put a like on this video. Leave your likes to the next video. If, even if you liked it, you're wrong. I'm telling you, I haven't, I haven't been at my best on this. It was too much. Right, I bit off more than the, I could chew, didn't I? I bit off more. Than, I've got through it, though. My back's hurting at the moment. I've been suffering for the last like three calls now with like back pain. Right, I need to have a walk around, stretch my legs. Uh, so don't put a like on it, right? If Don't put a subscribe on it. Just, just go, go. Just go now. Forget my Patreon. I've got a patron down there. You can join that if you want to support me. But why would you want to support me when you just see this rubbish for like two hours? Right? The three of you at the left watching this. Don't go. Go. Don't like it. Don't subscribe. Don't put any money in the tip jar. Yes, this is negative psychology, isn't it? It's, 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 I'm, trying, I'm saying not to do it. And then if all the contrarians that would normally put the money in or, or do anything for me like that would put the like on. They're going to have to do it now. You contrarians. There's a lot of prog contrarians, you see, you know. Reverse psychology, not negative psychology. I can't even bloody say that right, could I? God, give up. Give up. I give up. Go on, shoo. Get off. Sling your hook.